get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to, I almost said We Are Libertarians. Old Come on, Chris. Hard. I know. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show here on the We Are Libertarians Podcast Network. And we have one of our hosts, our affiliates, I don't know what they're called, client states. Who am the I? Brian, the Brian Nichols Show is here. All of them, Brian Nichols will join me and we're going to talk about how to sell libertarianism. Some of us are not great at it. Some of us need help. I, of course, am not one of them, but I could always learn a few things. So that's what we're going to do right after these messages. Warning. This show is for adults by semi-adults. So the language is some warning. This show is for adults by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. Our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. If you struggle to understand politics, we explain it from an independent libertarian point of view. With all of the irreverence it deserves, we toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, Chris Spangle, a 15-year veteran of politics and media. Thanks for joining us here on the show. It is great to be with you. As the man said, I'm Chris Spangle. If you're new here and want to learn more about my bio and beliefs and all my projects, check out chris-spangle.com. Now, before we start, I want to thank all of the members of Wall Plus, W-A-L Plus. They are the people that make all of this function and operate. They're the reason the show and the network exist. And you can support the show by visiting joinwallplus.com and learn about all the great benefits of subscribing, like commercial-free podcasts, bonus content. And I want to especially thank our $100 a month members, John Pusillo, Casey Feldposh, Lars Nordskog, Jake Edel, Matthew Durbin, Jeff Bennett, Reinhold, Christy Avery, and Jason Doolittle. Thank you to every one of our Wall Plus subscribers for keeping the We Are Libertarians podcast network thriving. Uh, we are absolutely thriving. We have been having some great conversations off air about the future of the entire network. Everybody is very pumped. Woo! Rimzo, Sorry. congratulations to Rimzo on things I cannot tell you about because I don't think I'm allowed to say it. There's We're a rule. Oh. There's a rule where I work, Brian, and it's don't tell the boss because he might accidentally say it out loud on the air. And uh, I am it's starting to exhibit habits of that. And uh, you know, Ginger Archie with Trisha Stewart Man and the forthcoming History of Modern Politics podcast. We recorded the first two over the last couple weekends. I appreciate you all. Uh, Hopefully not noticing my absence over the last couple of weeks. We had to get that template right and get that. We re-recorded the first episode and took a lot of work. But the first you officially articles, did. Wow, that's a lot mm -hmm. of work, Chris. Jeez. Yes. So God bless you. <laughs> so this this history podcast that is going to be available in 2021 to Wall Plus subscribers at the $10 and up level. It's Matt Whitliff and I going through starting in Rome, Brian. And we're going to finish in the modern day and start talking about what is the history of the welfare state? What is the history of gun rights? What is the mm. history of abortion? What is, mm. but first you've got to start with like who's Caesar, right? In the Roman Republic. <laughs> I promise they're related. Yes. And so, I mean, I've spent the last four months reading about the Anglo Saxons and the Vikings and the constitutional law. And I've learned so much. I know the difference between Roman and common law now. It's fantastic. <laughs> Um, but it's been a great education for me. But man, it is it has been a lot of work for both Matt and I. And the, uh, two or three different points, we both looked at each other and said, "I, I got to quit. I can't do this. You're going to have to do this alone. I'm sorry." Um, but we we've we finally got the first two. They'll be out in May here for uh, the Wall Plus subscribers. You if you if you don't want to sign up yet, and I don't know why you wouldn't because it's going to be awesome. Then just go subscribe to the free feed at historymodernpolitics.com. And you can get the email updates. And when it comes out in a free version down the road, ad supported in 2022, then you'll be the first to know. Thank you. We already have like 100 subscribers so far. It's fantastic. Um, but that is where I have been and may occasionally be. He's uh, alive is what you're <laughs> trying to say. So folks who are yeah. worried, Chris is alive and well. He's just busy. Well, Brian, um, I know you're exhausted. I'm exhausted. <laughs> 
Uh, we're recording this on Wednesday night because I'm going to be in Kentucky Kingdom on Saturday. Uh, you put in, you put out three shows a week. I tried that, and I'll never. I- I'll do it again four. in two years to learn my lesson. You put out four now. Yeah, the Sunday I'm doing show. four Sunday show. Yeah, my, my Sunday candidate series. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Because you have I don't a know job, and what, I mean, it, it is a lot of work podcasting that I don't. I don't think people quite get that. Yeah, I mean, I like I, I like this whole liberty world. Believe it or not, despite the slings and arrows that we constantly find ourselves receiving, I like it. I like that we're what we're doing actually matters, and it's helping make people's lives better. I think at the end of the day, so if you don't believe in the product that you're selling, get out. Like like if you if you forever you're like, oh, is this the right product for people? Like stop selling it, and and, and maybe look at the product better. Or just go to a different market. And in this case, like I firmly believe that what we're offering as a solution to the problems of the world, when when it revolves around liberty as an actual solution, it's gonna make people's lives better. And and I know it's a lot, you know, doing doing a show four times a week, it's a lot, but at the same point in time, I get a lot of value out of it. I mean, I, I find a lot of meaning, a lot of purpose out of it, and knowing that it's it's helping change the way that we talk about these ideas. I mean, I'm Candidly, I'm hearing the, the conversations are different now um, versus where they were three years ago. And that's exciting because the way that I've been trying to help get the audience to focus more on being solutions oriented versus just telling people why we're right and starting to hear that now applied across the board in the way that not just podcasters or, or these different activists are speaking, but now we're hearing elected officials or politicians that are running as libertarians talking the same way. And it's, it's I think it's we're going to see a direct correlation with us talking about these problems as problem solvers and us actually winning elections. I've had Trisha Butler on my show recently because she won her election and talked about how she won her election. And guess what? We found out she won her election because she was able to be a real person and meet people where they're at and talk about the issues that people cared about in her area of Clarksville, Tennessee. And that matters because instead of telling people what they should be concerned about, she said, Hey, Talk to me. What matters to you? And, and with that, was able to articulate a message of liberty to people on the issues that were mattering to them at the time that it was in their mind. Having that conversation with them after they've already entered into that conversation they're having in their mind is super important. And we too often don't do that. So I think that's why, despite, Chris, the, the exhaustion, it keeps me going because this is something I get really passionate about. And I know we are making a difference. And if we can help sell people on these ideas, it can actually make like people's lives better right now. And that's so exciting. I think there is. So if you go to libertarianpodcast.com, I put this first list together in like 2013 and you could, you could put a list of libertarian podcast on a single word. Document, right? <laughs> so it was us like Tom Woods wasn't even out yet. Like it, yep. it, I think out of the people that were on that list, we're pretty much the last show that is still on there. Uh, or not in jail. And now, you know, if you go to libertarianpodcast.com, which is a free service from the network where we try to promote all the libertarian podcasts because we're um, we're generous and thorough like that. Uh, there's a ton good. there's a ton on there from a broad spectrum. And the thing that is different between now and 2013 is a you don't have to explain how to download a podcast to get somebody <laughs> to listen to your show. And B the liber- wait, wait, wait. Number one, you don't have to explain what a podcast is to no, start. <laughs> it's literally we had to have a page on the website that explained how to download this because yeah, what is this thing you are putting right. on your phone? Is it a virus? Dude, now it's like a multi-billion dollar industry and money is rolling in and it's just crazy. It's crazy how it's all changed. But I think this medium more than any other, because there were libertarian blogs, there were libertarian video people, like you know, Julie Borowski is still out there making videos. But I, I'm not totally sure why libertarian podcasting caught on, but it has made such a sensational impact on the movement. Some might say good, some might say bad, but it's had an impact nonetheless. Um, and you you can find, like on that list, just a different variety of people, a different mm-hmm. variety of strains of thought. That's what we try to do here at We Are Libertarians is give a broad spectrum in, in fun and entertaining podcasts but I think that what is it about the podcast medium that you have found? Because when did you start your show? Three, four years ago? January 2018. 
Okay, yeah, so, yeah, somewhere around there, right? So, as you've done your your show, what is it about the podcast medium that you think connects to potential libertarians, old libertarians, and future libertarians? The medium podcasting specifically, yeah, I think we we especially with the advent of these newer um, audio technologies like the the in ear headphones, the noise canceling headphones. You, you now have a situation where to be able to walk around and, and I'm seeing this myself. And this is when I really started to listen to podcasts is that there were countless hours in a day where I was doing mindless activity and I was either listening to the radio or I was you know listening to commercials. <laughs> so I, I, then I, when I found podcasts, I was like, Oh, I can not only listen to something of value, that's going to help me become hopefully a better person, but also it's about something that I really care about. And I think there's a lot of people out there, Chris, and this is, I know we see this, this argument a lot, you know, is everybody out there actually libertarian? Well, half people are going to say no, because you just look at the past year and a lot of people were like, lock this sucker down. And then they look at the other half and they're like, no, you know, don't tread on me. So you're like, okay, well maybe half the country is libertarian, but I think there is a libertarian sentiment across the board, which is candidly why I made this bumper sticker. One of the, the things I give away to all my Patreon numbers at $5 a month is don't hurt people. Don't take their stuff. This notion, it, it transcends politics. It transcends party lines. It transcends these ideas. And instead, it, it, if we can tie that idea to libertarianism, which I think overtly most people live their lives in that way, that they start to look it up. And they try to figure out, okay, what do I believe? What, what, who, who am I? And podcasting really gives you an in-depth, intense, very personal look at not only the ideas, but it really pushes you to question your beliefs. I mean, Chris, honestly, I came into the entire libertarian movement kind of like one of those like conservatarian Republicans and listening to shows like yours. Um, that was something that was super helpful for me because it helped me Re refine why I believe why I believe because I think we all kind of walk around having these and if we're talking a sales term we have these objections pop into our head constantly right and when you listen to the libertarian podcast it gives you the tools to help overcome those objections because if you're going to have those objections in your head nine times out of ten there's other people out there who are having objections in their head and they're already thinking about our stuff what about the people who aren't even in our radar right they're not even thinking about these ideas of liberty they're not even having to grapple with these these different concepts so i think that's why particularly for libertarians who are starting to self-identify and look out there for information that libertarian podcasts have so much value because it helps us become better advocates and and better communicators for ultimately i hope the goal is to get liberty in our lifetime and make more people's lives more free right now yeah i would definitely say that the ability to niche down and i think filling the vacuum as as talk radio has just descended from what i i mean i i do this because i wanted to be in talk radio that's where i started my career in 2004 it's so uh, different it's it, wild i work in i work in radio now and, and my day job it's just uh i couldn't imagine trying to get a job at a talk radio station if i could <laughs> um, they're just, they're just, it's very difficult. They, they'd rather, yeah, I'm not going to go into it for fear of losing my job, but I will say podcasting allowed people like me who have that, that spirit or goal to come in and do things differently, tr test out a bunch of different things. We're like on the eighth version of we are libertarians, you know, like there, there's, there's a pioneer spirit here that I think is really interesting. And for all the, like, listen, I, I've checked out on social media. Like I don't follow, I think you're on Twitter now way more than I am. And that, that has maybe inverse, but I, I would just, I don't know if you schedule your tweets or what, but I, oh, yeah, no, I can't. I, yeah. No, who sweets a gem? Thank God. Yeah. Because I just look and I'm like, none of this is real life. I can't, I can't connect to any of the conversations that are happening here after checking out for five or six months. Um, and, and I think there's a disconnect between what goes on on social media and Twitter and libertarian Facebook and in the groups and within the libertarian party on the grassroots level or just in your community? You know, like if you want to know what politics is, go show up at a city council meeting. It may not necessarily be reflected in, you know, the your podcast or, right. or your podcast, but your, your movement's podcast. I mean, how... 
as you go and talk to folks, because you you talk to a ton of interesting folks, I don't know where you find so many people to talk to that are a, a high quality guests that are always interesting. Like, have you thought about that disconnect between what's happening on the ground in everyday regular person's life versus the conversation that libertarians are having amongst each other? What's oh that? Oh my break? god. Chris, it's a nightmare. Um, but that's candidly in my intro why uh, my my good buddy Matt, when I he he recorded it, the the main part of it is talking about the issues that people care about, and that's the the number one thing that my show I've tried to do is be that bridge. How can we talk about ideas that we really care about? And this is something that I think we gotta get better at. We really care about our ideas and our issues that matter to us, but that doesn't mean everybody else does. And, and it's not on us to make them care about what we care about, but rather it's to enter into whatever conversation that they're having right now in their real life. And, and Chris, you, you hit the nail on the head because I actually remember when you said this back when I first started listening to the show about getting involved locally. And I was like, yeah, I like that because yeah, go to your school board. Like if you're an upset parent, go to the school board and Tell your, your school board what's up because you're you're exponentially going to have more weight in changing the policy as a voter for your school board than you would be if you're a voter for president. I mean, that's just that's just pure statistics, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why it's so important for us libertarians to stop focusing on what we consider to be the number one issues. We need to start focusing on what does America Right. And if we're going to talk about American libertarianism, what does America think is the issues from a national perspective? And don't try to push out eight to 10 different little messages at once. Focus on two or three. That's really all we can <laughs> comprehend. And, and try to focus on those things as those are the top button issues. And, and that's why I, mean, I, I gave a lot of grief last year, particularly to LP National, because we missed an entire year of focusing on what was top of mind for pretty much all of America. And that was this gigantic pause button. And I know it was different for some folks out in more rural areas. You and I were having some pretty good conversations there about what you were experiencing in Indiana versus me in Philadelphia. Well, Chris, I got good news. We just got word that if we're good in, I think the next week or so, we are going to have all of our restrictions lifted. So finally, <laughs> after a year and two months, Pennsylvania is catching up, but we still have to wear masks. Um, to where, to where we until seventy percent vaccination. This is one one reason why I love having the network because you've got to have people of different thinking patterns, different parts of the country, different backgrounds, different oh, so beliefs, important. Right? It's like here in Indiana, we've had no restrictions really since July. That's insane. Early July, like I went to wow. service. I went to service on Sunday, uh, full <laughs> congregation, not one mask in the entire room. I mean, like. Chris, I was driving home and in, in, in on the parkway. So if, you, if people are familiar with Philadelphia, on the Ben Franklin Parkway, you're driving towards the art museum. And I'm not even kidding. I probably could count on one hand the number of people I saw not wearing masks outside. Right. It, it's a different world. Yeah. No, which is why we're trying to get you to move. Like, <laughs> lockdowns bother you so much. Why are you living there? Like, Rimzo came to visit Indiana and he goes, I went to Noblesville to a shopping mall and I saw people shopping and I didn't know what the hell was going on. <laughs> I was like, Yeah. People? Yeah. We literally, like, it's not been. Whereas I think if you look at a lot of the, like, the, the extremist elements of the right, I live a, a lot closer to a lot of those people and it's a mm -hmm. lot more unnerving because you're, you're friends and family with those people. They tell you what they don't say online. You know, so I just think like you've got to have um, a, a council of people around you to kind of like help keep you balanced. And that's one thing that the network does a great job for all of us. Oh, for sure. Um, but I, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think there um, I don't know that we disagree on this, but maybe we can talk this out where a movement is not necessarily a, a company. Um, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, but. Like what, what we do, what I do on my show and what we do on the network is come at things from a lot of different angles and talk out a lot of different issues. Like I don't necessarily see my job as a salesman. I mean, I do sell libertarianism. I do convert people to libertarianism if you want to make it um, ecumenical. Um, but, you know, my job is to help people make sense of their world, what's happening in the news and the things that confuse them because they're not really paying attention. If you give me an hour and a half, I'm going to help you understand what's going on in a way that's not going to put you to sleep. Um, a movement is going to attract a bunch of different people. 
mm-hmm. a a Mises caucus member likes Dave Smith, and there will be other libertarians that are completely repelled by that vein, you know, and they may like I don't know who those people like, you know, or there are people who don't like either of those groups, but they just like Spike Cohen. Like, you know, there's there's different tastes for different varieties of people. And a movement has to have a broad spectrum. So how can you really get to two to three issues, two to three messages? I do agree that National completely botched like the lockdown message. Um, but um, how, how do you how can you make a movement that is full of so many veins of people march in step on two to three issues? <laughs> Well, Chris, um, it, and first, have I misdiagnosed that? Is that an unfair characteristic? No, what- no, no, no. I, I think I, I, I definitely see the concern. And I think part of it is we maybe you're saying a movement is not a company. You're right. It's not a company, but it has similar goals, right? A company has at the end of the, the month a, a goal. And that's that in some let's pretend it's a, a for profit company, right? It's it's either a to to hit your your revenue expectations and then b to start to get a profit right so that you're you have some objective goal that you're measuring for and and for the libertarian movement as a just a you know small l movement we really have no objective goals so what happens is you have these little collective groups that form and they say well hey i guess we're gonna make this and they'll make their version of what our goal is and then the other little high group's gonna make their goal so everybody's aiming for their own little individual goals whereas we have to look well what's the libertarian party's role and i say the libertarian party's role is actually much more in line with that of a company in terms of having real things that they can objectively measure as success so not just vote totals but also membership totals, but also uh, elected officials across the, the country in terms of, you know, federal, state, local elections. So, th- I mean, there, there are KPIs beyond fundraising goals and so forth. So we can look to those numbers, number one. But number two, if we're trying to increase those numbers across the board, we have to effectively know who our target market is. So I think what happens more often than not is libertarians think this is who my target market is. And they just go in And they throw it against the wall and they hope it sticks instead of actually looking to see who are we talking to based on what are top of mind issues on a national scale. Now, there are tons of different consumer data uh, services that we can we can utilize. And and it's not a matter of, I think, you know, it being some revolutionary thing. Everybody knows to go ahead and look at data, look to see who you're you're trying to target. But also, it's not just who you're trying to target, but when you're talking to these people, finding issues that not only do they care about, but issues that motivate them, issues that are going to push them to the ballot box, that's going to push them to give a donation, that's going to push them to sign up a membership. And that's an entirely uh, you know similar situation that you see in any organization that's trying to do sales and marketing, is, is you're, you're trying to sell your service, you're trying to sell your product, and it's trying to find that right person that not only has a problem needing being solved, looking for that solution and then having that motivating factor to push them to making that actual buying behavior, that buying decision. So it all goes hand in hand, but I think it's almost a matter of what's the goal. And this has been the the age old question, right? What's the goal of the libertarian party? Is it to be the, the educational resource or is it to win elections? I think it has to be both in order to be successful and we can measure objective KPIs across the board in both those regards, because as the party grows, I think we're going to see it as a an educational tool become larger. But also as we win more elections, that's going to build more trust. And building trust is so important, not only in sales, but in politics. Because if you want to create a long-lasting relationship with someone, they have to be able to enter into that relationship saying, not only do I trust your ideas, I trust you. I'm voting for you as the arbiter of these ideas. You're carrying these ideas into office. Now I had to see what's your your track record, and and I think this maybe is where we've hit the the milestone, Chris. Is that we only have so many wins to refer back to. So if I'm running for city council here in Philadelphia, and they say, okay, well, where have you won? I have to like look, look far and wide for a large city like me, and it might be halfway across the United States. That's not going to change as many people's mind in terms of trusting my, my vote. So when we start to look for elections, we can win. 
it's important that we go all in on those elections, especially if they're local elections, because then that's going to build up that bench. That's going to build up those referenceable accounts if we're going to take a sales uh, a sales analogy, right? So I think that kind of all goes hand in hand. I hope that answered your question, but that I think that is kind of where my head goes towards when I hear the the differences that we had there. Yeah, no, I th- I would say um, the party is different than the movement, and that often seems to get completely confused by people. I I, I am a I've been a member of the party since 2007. I was part of the the Prague takeover. I, this is my fourth takeover. Like I, I'm not impressed by any of you people anymore. Right, right. Like I'm an old man. Uh, I retired before most of you heard about Ron Paul. Um, so you know, and, and, and part of the Prague takeover of 2009 through 2012. Um, was to professionalize the party, right? It was it was to to be very clear about what you just outlined. Are we an edge? Because there weren't caucuses, right? There were no caucuses until 2018. Now everybody's racing to a caucus, and it's like unnecessary, unnecessarily factional. Like it was like a, a an up or down. Like you were for complete government abolishment or for. Uh, mostly abolishment, right? <laughs> like uh, you go and watch Gary Johnson versus Lee Wrights, and you could vote for either of those people in 2012. But the 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 party was largely in the hands of people who viewed it as an educational vehicle and didn't think that the party could actually win elections. And people led by Mark Rutherford and a lot of people from Indiana, including myself, felt that that was completely backwards. Yeah, you're going to educate along the way, but you're going to educate the basic principles of libertarianism by identifying those top three or four issues that voters care about in your area. If you're running for a school board election talking about abortion, you're way off, right? And that was what a lot of the quote-unquote radicals of the period would do is they'd like run for a local office and talk about wildly federal issues or they'd, you know, they'd mimic Ron Paul for a school council. You're just like, you're, you're way off. Like foreign policy has nothing to do with this race, right? So very much in line with what you're talking about. I take a much more hardline stance in that the Libertarian Party's job is to get people elected to office. It is to be the political arm of the, the Libertarian movement. The, the ideology and working out the current events and the Libertarian response to current events is best done by think tanks and podcasters. Amen. You know, it is not best done by candidates. Candidates, because the problem with trying to view a political party as an ideological vessel where idea ideology is discussed and, and hammered out in, in, in the platform and all that stuff is is it makes it so messy that you have an intractable organization like the Libertarian Party has become. There's no real work that gets done in the Libertarian Party. It is just fighting over who has the best messaging, which is like, to me, the most boring, meaningless argument, right? Like me- when I hear people talk about messaging, I'm just like, what's your strategy to win? How many doors are you going to knock on? Because like that, that is so... Think about this way. The messaging, if we're talking about like having a pizza delivered, you you order a pizza from from Domino's, right? Nice gluten free pizza for my celiac ass over here. And we get the pizza and I open it up and there's only like two or three pizza pieces of pizza. I would be like, wait, where'd the rest of my pizza go? That's what we're doing when we're only focusing on one or two or three areas of the necess- ne- the necessary components to actually grow this thing, right? So yeah. if we're only focusing on the messaging, that that's great. That's like one piece of the total pizza. We need to be focusing on so much more, and and that's why. And this yeah. is my this is my beef with a lot of the conversation that goes on now. We're talking about what issues will be best to to motivate people, and that's not what wins elections. What wins elections is supply chain. How are you going, you know, like if I sat you down and said, I need you to make a million dollars in sales this month and I give you no sales leads, no software to do that, no phone, then you're not going to get a million dollars in revenue that month, Brian. And the the reason that the Libertarian Party is mostly not functional and mostly non-functioning is that there's never been a database. There's no on the ground strategy. There is nothing but infighting about messaging when that is like, I mean, you tell me in in your world of professional sales, messaging and what you're going to put on the marketing materials and in your sales script is like step 10, right? Like that to me is what what nobody's talking about. And that's because there's a lot of inexperienced people who think they know what they're talking about and they just don't. Um, any, anyway, in rant. Um, <laughs> but that that's that's kind of what 
why I really like your message is that it, it's there's got to be some practical steps to get to the victory. And the people that you talk to on your podcast, The Brian Nichols Show, give you a lot of those outlines and leaves, you don't leave ideology at the door, but let's be functional. So like if I were yeah. to say to you, all right, messaging man, like when you look at what's gone, where we're at now, what are like the three things that you think your average libertarian listening listener can do to kind of get not just the party, but the movement to a functional place? A functional place. Well, number one, shut up. Stop talking. And what you need to do instead... Oh, he doesn't like it when you do that to him, though, does he? Oh, yeah. I don't. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm muted. Throw my hands in the air. <laughs> what? But no, seriously, shut up. Stop talking and start asking better questions and then listening. That's what we need to start, number one, do. Because people, if we were to ask them, hey, what, what, what do you think is like the number one or two big concerns in your community. Guess what? They're going to tell you. They're they're not going to they're not going to like shy away. If somebody how many how often people will say, ah, hey, "How you doing?" Ah, I could complain, but ah, you won't care, right? Yeah, they will, they could complain and they will complain. And when they complain, it's on us to be listening for what the actual problem is, not maybe what they think their problem is. So maybe they say, "Yeah, you know, I, I can't afford my health care. We need to have universal health care." They're, they're not, their problem isn't that they, they think that government needs to be the solution. Their problem is that they want to have their health care be cheaper, right? So what I've tried to do, and, and I'll segue to my show for a hot sec, is I try to have people on my show who are answering that question. How can we have cheap health care? Okay, I had Dean Clancy on my show, and he talked about health savings accounts for all. Basically, taking what you can get from your private company where you can get a health savings account where a part of your check is taken every single month tax-free going into a special account that goes right to your health account or your health uh, costs. Why not give that to every American? So talking about that as a, a viable solution to a problem they're hearing, addressing their concerns, validating their concerns, and then overcoming that objection with a real tangible solution and having something to refer back to that they can say, oh, I see that actually worked. So I would say, number one, that would be uh, step uh, one they can take for an action. I'm shut up and listen. Uh, number two is to focus on on not rhetoric, but rather uh, policy. So I don't know about you, Chris, but like I've always found that the best way I have learned is when I don't realize I'm learning. And the mm -hmm. same thing is true in terms of becoming a libertarian. People will inherently realize the value of libertarian ideas. Because here's the thing. We don't need to have this conversation about if our ideas are right, because we, we've already done that. We know our ideas are right. So let's stand by them. And, and we stand by them by not just talking about the ideas, but actually getting them into policy and starting local. Make things better in your local community right now. And that is going to be one of the best things we can do. Because once people start to see the problems that they see in their communities being solved by libertarian solutions, it no longer is the group of people who talk and rant all day online, but rather it's the people who are getting the problems solved in their communities that the other two parties couldn't get done because they were too busy on trying to, to pad their, you know, the pad their wallets or trying to, you know, give their fundraising buddies some, some extra dollars back or giving some quid pro quo to people in different uh, roles in government. Like that's something that people all acknowledge happens but like nobody else is doing anything to solve that problem. So let's be that problem solver. So I'd say right there, Chris, one and two, that's something you can do right now. What, so what do you say to the person who says that number two is kind of boring? Like, you know, okay, this person got elected and all right, picking up trash on May 1st, fine. But that doesn't bring in, that doesn't bring them in like the memes does. You know, or, do you know, or, do you know that Illinois doesn't have an income tax? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, Illinois doesn't have an income tax, and they tried to put it on the ballot uh, a couple of elections ago. And and guess what? Illinois, the blue state, voted overwhelmingly no, no <laughs> to no income tax. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, because that state said no. We 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 understand the value of what we have in this liberty idea because the people realize that they would have so much money taken out of their paychecks every single week. So how about this? Let's start showing more and more money in people's paychecks. Let, that's something that people will appreciate right now. Start to focus on ways that you can provide better services outside of the, the realm of government. If you're a private sector you know, person is looking to like make money while also solving a problem, here you go. This is the, I mean, that's why we see so many libertarian solutions popping up. 
Yeah, I guess I guess my question is better rephrased. In an age where rhetoric is king, mm. hard to push policy. It's hard to push the the nuts and bolts of what you're talking about. How have you tried to crack that code of getting through a positive message that isn't trying to put too many people down? I mean, listen, you're going to offend somebody if you speak out loud. So you can't, <laughs> but you do your best to be nice. You're always polite. Um, wh- wh- where have you tried to find that balance between just playing to the fans? Because you could make mm-hmm. way more money as a libertarian, Brian, if you played to the li- libertarian cheap seats versus trying to, like, you know, feed them spinach right like where's that line for you how do you try to balance that well so my goal has never really been to get more listeners my goal has been to get liberty in our lifetime like and that's kind of when i started my show like i i realized the value of what we're talking about like i see it in my life i see you know the the living don't hurt people don't take people's stuff like the evolution of the show chris for my show has has taken like this you know, I'm talking to, uh, you know, these, these conservatarian folks or talking to people who are like socialists and, and trying to just have these like really random and philosophical conversations to having experts on the show who are experts in their field, politicians, elected officials, economists, CEOs, um, you know, C-level executives talking about, uh, you know, different industry professionals or, or scientists and realizing that as I'm having these conversations with people, and I was always talking about educating, enlightening, and informing, but like realizing that beyond that, it's also now talking about not just the problems, but these are people who are actually helping solve these problems. So like one of the, the biggest issues I've always heard whenever I, people are like, oh, what are you? Oh, you're a libertarian? Oh, oh yeah, move to Somalia, right? Because that's the, that's the caricature that's been presented as what libertopia would look like. But rather, if we can start to point to areas that are becoming overtly libertarian, it will enhance our rhetoric. It will give us more ammunition. Only this ammunition is not going to be based on empty platitudes or empty promises, but rather it's going to be based on real tangible successes that we're having. And oh, by the way, along the way, we're making people's lives better. It's a win-win, I think. Yeah. So number one, listen to people more. Yes. Try to meet them where they're at. Number two, yes. lay down the rhetoric and start feeding people with good information. And number three is what? Number three is, I think once you offer the solution, is to then tell their story. And I just actually spoke with Matt Kibbe here in, on the show. We're recording here on Wednesday. He was on the show. It aired this morning. Um, and one of the things, it's, I was on his show back in December, and my show was called To Sell Liberty More, Ask Better Questions. Well, for his show, I said, To Sell Liberty More, uh, Tell Better Stories. And, and I think right there, we... And this maybe goes full circle, Chris, back to your question originally about, you know, why libertarian podcasting has had such success is because when we start to tell the stories and I know I see it in my numbers, some of the best episodes I have are when people who have been facing some crazy atrocities or they've seen, you know, they're telling an awesome story of where liberty has really helped their lives. Those episodes skyrocket because people want to hear how this will look. It's one thing to talk about the non-aggression principle and the free market and the invisible hand. It's another thing to talk about how that impacts Susie, the single mom who her husband had a massive heart attack and all of a sudden she was facing economic hardship and here's how a libertarian's policy helped her life get better. That's a different message than us just talking about, you know, Rothbard and Hayek all day. So I think telling stories will be the, the ultimate, you know, it, it keeps people coming back. And, and we see this in Hollywood. You know, politics is downstream of culture. And what is culture? Culture is nothing but us sharing stories and building up some common bonds and commonalities between those bonds through that mutual sharing of stories. So let's make sure that we're the ones telling the stories. You know, uh, I forget what podcast I was just listening to, but they're talking about the end of Hamilton, how um, when you had, spoiler alert, John Adams' wife um, singing her part, you know, who's going to tell my story? She's like, I am. And then uh, it's like, oh, that's kind of important, right? Who's actually telling the stories? So if you're a good storyteller, get out there, be active in telling those stories, reach out to people. And if you have a story to tell, it's on, it's on you to, to please help, help us tell your story. If, if you have a story, reach out to Chris, reach out to me, like use the platforms we've built to help tell your story. Cause there's other people who are going to be inspired by that. Yeah. That was the entire like central theme of the first episode of the history of modern politics that we just did, where we start with a historian who helped shape the, the consciousness of Britain. His name was Bede. 
And we really only know about a lot that happened in English history because of this one guy writing things down in 700 with fantastical sources like giants are roaming the earth. Like, you know, it, you know, fields are sprouting because of saints blood. Like, but it's just because of one dude telling a story that we have generations of human beings that just believe this thing. It's like, Washington never chopped down a cherry tree. It's just that right. it entered public consciousness because of this one story, and everybody just kind of accepts that as fact, right? Like, you know, wearing a mask outside protects you. It's sort of like, where'd that come from? Like, that, you know, these stories just infiltrate, and people buy them and believe them. So, and really quick, Chris, and I don't mean to interrupt your thought there, but, like, that's also why I was so fervent at the beginning of the pandemic in, like, trying to put a narrative out there because I was like, we need to make sure, and I know like a lot of people are like, Brian, you're you're being way too crazy. But I was like, listen, I'm living in Philadelphia and I'm seeing what's still happening here in terms of like government just being like, we have this nice power and we like it and we're not gonna get it back. But like setting the narrative straight and like when things just didn't make sense, like why should I wear a mask outside? Like there there that just that does not make sense to anyone. And like being being okay with saying that despite the government experts or the government scientists not being the ones to say it first. Like, don't be afraid of that. Like, that's okay. Now, if we're going to go out there and, and like, you know, promote an idea of putting Lysol in your system, right? That's a different thing. Oh, by the way, that was a government official saying that suggestion, right? I know tongue in cheek, he didn't really say it, but long story short, it's no, important. Not the government. He's fighting the deep state, you silly goose. Oh, while expanding um, through behind like FISA and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I know. He's he's a gem. Liber I, most libertarian president of our lifetime. No. Yeah, I mean, uh, listen, I mean, from the beginning, my message was if you think the CDC is not a political organization that bends to the public will or to the will of the people who are paying them, you're insane. Dr. Fauci, he's a, he's a government bureaucrat. He's the highest yeah. paid government bureaucrat at that. Yeah, I mean, and where I I have not yet listened to the episode, but I appreciate the title. Did we go too far in lockdown messaging? Because there were points and there are people in my life where I am much closer to you than most when it comes to lockdown stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And like then someone will just take it and go way over here with it. And you're just like. All right, why can't we just keep it where Brian keeps it, right? Like, let's just keep it here. Like, let's keep it focused on the government. Let's not go into the vaccines and the microchipping and Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. like, and that's where I think a lot of that stuff kind of lost me, where it's, it. I think a lot of last year, um, there had to be a nice balance between dealing with people's fear and being somewhat empathetic to that, but also being firm and tough with them and saying like the government cannot save you the best that it can do is send you $1,200 when there's a crisis. Like you need yeah. self-reliance, you need personal responsibility, shelter in place is perfectly okay voluntarily. That's what will help keep us all safe. But like once the government gets involved, it breeds resentment and it backfires and look where we're at now. I mean, and it, and it just seems like nobody really learned any lessons last year. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I've had more people, more Democrats, I think, come to me in the last year and say, like, I now see what you're saying about the government not being trustworthy, not having our best interest at heart. And I think some of that was because we tried to be somewhat empathetic to people being concerned about it, as opposed to like, F you sheep with your face diaper, you know, it's like that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, and I still I just think some of that stuff, I I'd love to get your thoughts on that, because um I, I think we kind of stepped on our own dick a lot in a lot of ways with a lot of normal people over the last year by trying to be too edgy, too hardcore and trying to like impress each other as opposed to the person who doesn't know what COVID is. Am I, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to do this? Is it like, no, just use your common sense. Yeah. <laughs> like well, and keep you safe. That's, that's why I think it's also important to get really good at sales. I mean, when we're talking on my show about sales, it's not just selling liberty. It's just sales in general, like the, the basic fundamentals of how to be a good articulator of ideas and, and getting people to buy what it is you're selling. Now, that sounds like, oh, like used car salesman, because that's just the persona that we've seen, you know, characterized in, in media. But rather, salespeople are problem solvers, right? So on the show, when you're being a problem solver, you're you're also being able to sell not only yourself in terms of solving problems, but ideas, products, services. So when we're looking at the COVID situation, Chris, like, and and this is where we have the, the brutalists in in the Libertarian Party that 
I mean, candidly, my first like feud, I guess, in the libertarian world was with Arvind Vora. And it was because I was like, what, why are we doing this gross messaging? Like, why are we making these like brutalist arguments? It doesn't make sense. And it, it's pushing people away. So when you look at, to your point, like, why would you say to somebody who is genuinely concerned and, and very scared, they're, they're afraid, why would you make them feel worse? But at the same point in time, if you knew that what they're doing is 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 completely backwards to the science, enter into that conversation and ask them why they're doing what they're doing. Now, now there are people who trust me. I I, I know I have a really good friend, and I'm not going to give any names, but really good friend who they got COVID, they have received both of their vaccinations, and they're still terrified about people not wearing masks. And I'm like, at that point, I'm sorry, like that's a little much, and that's something they're going to have to work through. But to the average person who was genuinely trying to figure out what was going on, that was a great opportunity for us to say, hold on, let's actually kind of like look at this with common sense, right? To not be a silly billy and actually figure out what's going on and, and not go this one unilateral approach that we have to lock down society, determine some workers to be essential and non-essential. And oh, let's put COVID patients in nursing homes. I guess that makes sense. So no, I, I think once we figured that out and we were able to articulate that COVID wasn't as scary as it had been presented, that was then an opportunity for us to make a better compelling argument to, listen, we can get back to 2019 right now if we actually follow the science, right? And no, you don't have to wear a mask outside. As a matter of fact, if you were outside, you're probably better off. We could, we could have made that argument, but the people who were instantly going in saying, wearing your face diaper. Like, guess what? That person now, not only are they not going to listen to you, you made them feel bad. And no, not just not pay attention. It, it, it takes the ability of those, like I've said it, a, I've said it a couple of times on the show, like that person made your job harder. Yes. You, you've had a lot of great shows on the lockdowns that are very responsible, very thoughtful, um, assertive without being an asshole. Uh, and that person makes it harder for others to listen to you because they go, well, he's just in that camp. He's a, he's a COVID idiot. Right. He's, yep. you know, and like, I, I, I have that conversation with, I have both sides and in, in my families, right? Like, it's like, you know, both extremes. And then sometimes my girlfriend and I just look at each other and go like, are we the only normal people left? Like, like we've right been there, hold on, right there. That, <laughs> that exact conversation, Chris is happening way more often than you think it is. And yeah. that's the, that right there, that is the person that we're trying to talk to. That is yeah. who libertarians need to be speaking to is the average person who's looking around being like, am I the only normal person? That's who our target market is. Yeah. It's not the average person who's focusing on like the 0.0001% issue that only they care about or a super, super small select group of people care about. Like that's not going to win them over. Like, I'm sorry. That's what we need to do is focus on your normal person. And actually one of the best quotes I got from Trisha Butler was make libertarians human again. We have to be human. Don't don't be this robot of I know M Mises, I know Rothbard. Like that doesn't right. do anything. Like how does that help solve problems right now? And don't just say, well, if they just did this, then this wouldn't happen. Like no, solve the problem. Go out and right now show how we can solve the problem. I used to do this with one of my little commie friends because he'd be like, well, we need to have a commie government. I'm like, all right, tell me what we're gonna do. Like sit, like, like let's build it for me. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, come on, man. Like you're if you're in charge, like you get to decide like, so what do you want to do? He said, well, I would ask, I would ask the experts, like the industry experts. I'm like, okay, well, who are they? Like, how would you determine what they are? And like, all of a sudden you see, oh shit, I have to like know the answers to this stuff. And, and that's where, if we enter into the conversations in this sales mentality, right. And I know, I'm sorry, I keep on going back to sales, but like sales, if you are asking good questions, you can really unwind somebody to just feel either like, oh shit, or genuinely start to question why they believe what they believe. You have done your job as a salesperson because now they're questioning enough to start to say, maybe they should replace their status quo incumbent idea or their incumbent solution with a new idea. And that's the hardest part, right? And, and in sales, we all know this, the, the easiest part is keeping a recurring customer. So instead of focusing constantly in the hard part of getting more and more libertarians, 
We need to be winning libertarians over, and I continue to go back to by solving the policy point. But then once they're the, once they see the value, keep them, help educate them, and and like don't feel that you have to do it all. I'm a really good articulator of libertarian ideas in terms of trying to break it down for your average person. But in terms of sitting there and trying to speak, like teach this stuff verbatim, it's ex it would be exhausting for me. So I would defer to like the engineer, if you will, um, if we were to use like a sales uh, analogy, right? Like go to that person who this is what they do all day long. They talk about economics all day long and they can talk about, you know, supply side versus, you know, demand, it, like they can make it so it, it makes sense to you. But let me peak interest and get them to at least say, can you tell me more first? Don't throw this book down their throat and think that that's going to help make them a libertarian overnight. That's not how it works. This is an age old problem. I don't know if you've ever read the great libertarian macho flash by Michael Cloud. I didn't. No. Uh, I will send it to you. And it's basically, uh, you know, this is an age old libertarian problem. John Hosper's first candidate for the libertarian party for president wrote the, the libertarian versus anarchist temperament, you know, like, we're, we'll be 97 years old listening to another libertarian set of baby podcasters going, man, these guys are rude. They're blowing <laughs> for everybody. Um, yeah. So I guess, uh, yeah, I, I, I think you're right. We need to identify their tar our target market. I am hereby announcing on the Chris Spangle show that the official target market for the We Are Libertarians podcast network is anyone that wants to join the Leave Me Alone caucus. Yes. It doesn't matter what party you're in. It doesn't matter if you're involved in politics or not. If you just want people to leave you alone so you can live your life and self-actualize in the best way possible, you belong. Welcome to the family. You don't have to do anything other than just leaving other people alone. And if anybody's not leaving you alone, then you know that they're the enemy. So uh, <laughs> we'll make buttons. There will be a website, I'm sure, soon. I will make I've it already up. written it down. I'm going to take that before you even get a chance. You cannot steal it. It's my intellectual property rights of the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Um. I've got to have one thing. You get, you got like lots of things. Like you got a bumper sticker and everything. Let me have one thing, Brian. Um, all right. So I'm sure people are sitting here listening. Let's wrap it up with this. All right. You two are libertarian podcasters. You're thought leaders. You guys are supposed to like, you get paid the big bucks to sit there and talk about all this stuff and that's way all right oh those Cato dollars yeah. oh, so nice I don't, I don't know i thought it was nice of, of the Koch brothers to send me what they did what did you like yours yeah when, when i got the um the, the inheritance there no no, no no just say it it I, okay i said too much i'm sorry yeah yeah, yeah. well what soros said was even better so she was a no i um but if you're just like a dude listening to this show or a gal let's be fair um and you're out there and you're like all right but that's what you guys are supposed to do i what am i how am i supposed to apply all this stuff brian how can i apply these three things you're talking about how do how does a regular person who doesn't have a podcast do it chris do you do you go to the office at all right now i mean i know we're kind of getting back to normal but do you go to the office at all yes yeah do, do you have coworkers? yes do you guys talk about things beyond work sometimes uh, yeah, there's one boomer in my office who will stand and talk about politics and won't let me get a word in edgewise. What about you? <laughs> uh, yeah, that'll happen from time to time. But how about like maybe like the, the non-political people, like people who are just like your average person that you guys talk about anything outside of work? Yep. Yep. I'm thinking of one person right now. Uh, they're my age and we'll talk about various things just like we're friends, right? We're friendly at work. Yeah. So does that person, um, do they tell you like, you know, whenever they have like a bad day, like, or they have something bad happen or something wrong happen? Yes. Do any of those things ever impact or are any of those things ever impacted by government being the problem? Every April 15th. Okay. Interesting. Right. So how about that? So maybe that person, you could enter into a conversation with them about taxes and how much you both hate taxes, right? As you get towards tax day and be like, man, it, it, could you imagine if we had to write this check at the end of the year, instead of like having to take off our paychecks every single month? Did I just Did get sales trained? <gasps> <laughs> wow. But like, think about it now. And, and then here's, here's what we did, right? We eliminated the people we don't want to talk to. I don't want to talk to the person who's like boisterous talking politics. Cause he's just going to be a blowhard. He wants to be the person who's sure. right. 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 We want to talk to the person who isn't being talked to, the person whose problems aren't being addressed. And when they feel cared for and they feel that they are understood, they are more willing to listen to what you have to say 
and believe that your ideas will actually help solve their problem. And once they trust you, then they will be willing to support you and go with you no matter where you go. That is what we need to get better at doing. And it can be done is in any regards. It could be done in your office. It could be done with a family member when you're at you know Thanksgiving dinner. It could be done at a cookout. Whatever you you find or whenever you find yourself talking to a normal person, that is a great opportunity to sell liberty. What if I get to that point? And I don't have the answer they're looking for. And I don't know enough about it. What do I so, do in that situation? That, that's actually a, a great opportunity to say, hey, listen, you know what? I actually don't know the answer to that. But I do definitely know that there are people in the greater liberty world who they talk about this stuff all day long. And, and genuinely, if you want to like dig into this a little bit more, how about this? Let me go ahead. I'll link you an article or a podcast that you could go ahead and check out. And then maybe we can go ahead and circle back and talk about it afterwards and see what your thoughts were. How's that sound? Right? So now what it's doing is you're, you're now leveraging the opportunity to say, Hey, listen, number one, I get it. Cause I don't know the answer too. They, they, they're saying, I don't know the answer. You can say, I don't know the answer, but let's find the answer together. So here, let me look in my resources and find somebody that we can present to it, you know, go ahead and look at and give them the opportunity to hit. And if you want to give me something, you, you, you know, find is like your data. Let's do that. And then have a, a conversation, but that's required them to do work. And actually in sales, we will do this sometimes, you know, with my team, if, if the guy's being a little push or a little uh, finicky, not wanting to set a next step, ask them to do more, say, Hey, you know, for, for next steps, go ahead and send over your invoices. Um, you know, we'll go ahead. You know, I need that by next Thursday. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and have the consultant give you a call that following Friday, right? setting that timeline and then asking them to do something a little bit more, it shows if they are willing to do that, that they're probably gonna have some buy-in. So if the person actually goes ahead and they're like, yeah, I'll listen to that podcast and they do it. And then they present you a podcast to listen. Now you're in the, the, the sales cycle, right? Now it's a chance for you to uncover objections, to isolate those objections, overcome those objections. And if you need backup, find the backup, get the resources available ready, at, you know, in case you need it. But then if you are, are finding yourself overcoming their objections and you're able to still constantly paint a better future for them and help them solve the reality gap, then at that point, you can try and make the sale. So, hey, you know, based on our conversation we're having, I mean, would it make sense to and then ask the question, right? Does this make sense or where am I wrong, right? Make it so it's a matter of not a yes or no, like I'm right, you're wrong, but more so is this making sense? And try to find the areas that you can find agreement versus the areas of disagreement and focus on those instead. Beautiful. So like if you were to lend some, uh, you know, wh where should people learn a more about you? But like if people want to learn more about these techniques that you're talking about, like do you have some episodes of your podcast, The Brian Nichols Show, that you would recommend starting with? Yeah, for sure. So um, first and foremost, The Brian Nichols Show, find it anywhere you look at podcasts. Um, also on YouTube, uh, The Brian Nichols Show, and then uh, the main spot where I'm doing a lot of my one-on-one -on -one trainings with my my patrons is, yes, Patreon. So um, I'm doing a lot of sales stuff there. I have an ebook coming out here uh, in the very near future and actually coming up here on Friday, uh, May 7th. Yeah, May 7th, I'm doing an episode um, where I'm going through said ebook and the ebook is four easy steps you can implement now to sell liberty to family and friends. And, and really what we're doing is we're walking through um, step by step, how you could more or less what we just talked about here, but going in detail, giving examples um, and showing how you can help sell liberty right now to people. And that's, I think, what we're looking for, an action item people can take and implement into their lives and actually make a difference. Just, so um, get comfortable talking about this stuff. Just yes. Yeah. Like politics doesn't have to be a blood sport, does it, Brian? No. So uh, one of my favorite bands is AJR. Huge fan of AJR. And they just had a new album come out called um, uh, OK Orchestra. And one of the songs is called Three O'Clock Things. And in the song at the very uh, towards the end of the song, um, they talk about how basically it's been conditioned that we're not supposed to talk about this stuff. Our parents have told us you're not supposed to talk about the politics. You're not supposed to talk about the differences, the, the bad things, but rather just focus on those good things. But no, we actually need to engage in conversation with each other. And instead of saying, ah, we're not supposed to talk about that. No, say, okay, here's a problem. Let's make this better. And right now the world is looking for authentic 
communicators of people who are actually trying to solve these problems in the world. We all see it. We all know the problems exist, but we are dying for just some authenticity of somebody who is saying like, listen, I hear you. I feel you. I love you. Oh, maybe that's what Trump was doing. Right. And that's why people gravitated towards him. Trump's a great marketer and great salesperson. And that's something we can learn from instead of saying like, we hate everything about him, learn what he did to get into office as the, the second highest vote getter. And then look at what Biden did to get even you, what you 7 million first, votes more. You mean first biggest loser? First biggest loser. Is that the, the show where they lose a bunch of weight on uh, ABC? No, I mean, I, I don't agree. I do agree that Trump is a brilliant marketer and, and a good salesperson. His team was phenomenal, by the way. It Behind the scenes, oh, he, they were so good. It's he's I think I think pushing that as an idea of someone to emulate is I would caution you on that because he's no, a no, no, not emulate. No, no, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's important to look and see what tactics he used because those tactics are going to be used against you. You need to be a good faith actor and use those tactics for good. Because otherwise there are people like a Trump who will then use them for nefarious purposes, right? So it's important on us to recognize when they're being utilized and then to use them better. And we can use them better because our product that we're offering is a better product. We just have to present it in a way that people are going to say like, oh yeah, it is a better product and it solved my problem. He, he was able to make people say, Trump loves me. That's weird. Like the fact that he was able to get people to be that tied to him, but he was able to not only meet them where they were at, but get them to drive towards him in record numbers, right? Like that's huge. But what did Biden do? Biden then ramped it up 7 million votes more by taking the very things that Trump did well and using them against Trump. Instead of Trump being just normal and shutting up when people were looking for some normalcy, he, he ramped it up to 11. And guess what Joe Biden did? He went to the basement, he ran a campaign that was make-believe, and he won the, the presidency by 7 million votes more than Trump had done back in 2016. That's something we can learn from on both sides, but we can do it better as libertarians. I think the lesson from 2020 is humility and pride. Like, I think Trump lacked humility to admit that he was making mistakes and doubled down out of pride instead of like... Cuomo too. Cuomo too. Yeah, stopping, yep. stepping back, looking, going... What I'm doing is not working and I need to change course. And what he did was say, this one in 2016, I'm inevitable. Yep. Let's double down and do more of it. And he was getting so much positive feedback because he didn't surround himself with people that could tell him the truth. Yes. Oh, it's so he's important. A, yeah, he's not a humble person. And I think you, if you had a different Trump, somebody who took testing seriously, somebody who didn't do the COVID charade when he got COVID, somebody who didn't threaten the 82nd Airborne on protesters that most of the public was in support of. Like, Trump could have walked away with that election bigly had it not been for his lack of humility. You know, and where where Biden, I don't think is necessarily a humble person, but he at least had the humility to go, I'm just going to not make myself the central issue and I'm going to hang back and I'm going to just let this fool hang himself. I don't think it was humility, Chris. I think it was a matter of, it, that was, that was entirely tactically done sure. because number one, they didn't want him talking because I mean, we're seeing the more Biden talks, the more he's his own worst enemy, but like if they could keep him in a bunker, they could control the narrative through marketing. And that was brilliant. Yeah. I mean, that was fucking brilliant. And, and the fact that like libertarians, I actually, so I did a, a kind of mini series on populism. We looked at Republican populism, democratic populism and libertarian populism. And instead of just saying populism bad, like realize what makes populism populism and why does populism constantly peek its head out in terms of a political movement. And it's, it's because in a world of democracy, you have to have some idea of populism and just the, by the very nature of the political system itself, because by its nature, you are a 50 plus 1% majority of a group of people who is now determining what the overall election is supposed to look, or rather the, the policy of the country. And I know that we, we are a democratic republic, but we're seeing more and more of this power being pushed to this federal government. And every four years, we basically elect our version of a little dictator who will put all their administrators into office and they'll take over all the different you know three letter organizations and they'll implement their policies from top down. And this happens every four years and every four years, the pendulum swings more and more and more. So acknowledging that that is what the situation is 
Now, I think we have a great opportunity to enter into the conversation of people realizing this isn't working and present the, the libertarian, not just the libertarian party, but the libertarian solutions as a real viable opportunity for us to make the country better and to make things less polarized, less intense. I mean, man, I think that doesn't, it just does make sense, right? And I think oh. if we can frame it that way, more and more people will be like, yeah, leave me alone. Like, let's do the leave me alone caucus. I'm on board. Uh, let's make it happen. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm, and I'm not a populist. I think that elites are always going to exist and serve some function. Um, yeah, but the would way, they be in government though? And that's the thing, like, where do we put it, that? It, 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 it's like, it is what it is, right? Like, they're, like, I'll let you argue with Murray Rothbard who agreed with me. Um, anyways. So we can get into that. But what populists do right, what Donald Trump did right, is simplicity. Build the wall. Lock her up, right? Like, what, what was Hillary Clinton's campaign message? I don't know. You don't know. Nobody remembers. Hillary Clinton doesn't remember. But you remember 2016. You remember, you know, I, I mean, I guess I don't know what his 2020 message was. So it wasn't as simple. Maybe it was, I'm not for black lives matter like well, I, that was part of his problem there there it, was no art, articulate message you, you can't yeah. say keep america great when you're facing an unprecedented <laughs> crisis like that no, slogan got crushed his his problem was he lacked credibility to the core like yes. people, people who were i was generally favorable for three years by the time we got to covid and the summer i was just like this guy is you know He's mad at Pelosi because he wants a bigger stimulus than Pelosi. What use is this person? You it's know? all theater. It's all Jack Hunter was on the show and and he summed it up perfectly. It's all wrestling, right? Yeah. You know, mutual friend. It's all wrestling. Jack knows and he he was, you know, firsthand seeing it. You know, Thomas Massey talks about his little pin being the precious, but knowing that as the power goes up, they're all playing the game. Like it, it, yeah. it's all make believe. And, and I think that's also a story we can tell. Tell those stories of the make-believe and how, how much bullshit it actually is from the people who are experiencing it firsthand. I mean, that HBO documentary that Massey was on, that was huge. Like, that, that's so important because he's able to then articulate to an audience of millions of people what's actually happening firsthand from his experience. And, and to call out the nonsense for what it is, that's why what we're doing is so important because we can call the nonsense for what it is. All right, I'll leave Massey alone because I know you like Massey, but he's I mean, an ally. He's he's an ally. Is he perfect? No. Don't don't it, listen. He held on to his precious after January sixth. That's all I'm saying. Like you know, we gotta <laughs> push, we gotta push our own. Same with Rand. Um, but overall, I totally agree with you. I think the Swamp was a great documentary. It it damn near made Matt Gates look human and likable. Um, and Massey was excellent in it. Uh, cannot recommend that documentary enough because Massey specifically really goes into why Washington as a whole just needs a complete douching. Um, so yeah, I, I, I agree with you. It needs to be simple. It needs to be just very clear. Here's what the message is because you're now getting to the point in your career where you're going to notice this. You pick one thing and you hammer it home, right? If you ask somebody, like, what does Chris Spangle stand for? Hating geese. Um, I get it, though. Generally libertarian. Um, <laughs> podcasting guy. Like, Wait, are you one of those left libertarian type? Yeah, according to some, but no. Believe sorry. Me. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, way, I'm, I'm probably more Republican than you are most of the time. But <laughs> the funny thing about having Ryan Lindsay on the network for six months is people don't think... It, it, Here's how I'd describe it, okay? In, the, in, in a world of a million media choices, everybody's vision is flat, okay? So they, they grab onto little hooks, very slight hooks. And if you repeat that hook enough, people kind of associate with... So every time you see a Canadian goose, you think of me making those jokes, right? <laughs> you, am I right? <laughs> and so it's a little hook that triggers that yeah. person's mind, right? Yeah. And so libertarians have never done a good job because... We need a complete system of overhaul. I need to sit you down and get you to change your entire political philosophy in a single conversation. <laughs> That's not how this works. It's, what? It doesn't? No, it's exactly what? like what you're saying. It's you got to hammer home one to five things, preferably three, that are positive, that speak to a person like, I'm going to educate your children better. I'm going to get you affordable health care, and I'm going to be bring, bring peace to the United States for the first time in 30 years. Oh, I'm in, you know, and you just repeat that over and over and over. So I mean, I think people, um, you need to study like 
three or four things, right? Like people care about the libertarian solution to healthcare. They care about the libertarian solution to immigration, the libertarian and like the real libertarian solution, the libertarian solution on, um, you know, like taxes, maybe I, I, I think like people think that they have to do a lot of work, Brian, to like convince their friends to be libertarian, but they really don't like it's leave me alone. Plus these three or four things. Yeah. And stop. Well, that's the problem right there. Stop trying to convince people, start solving their problems and you'll convince them along the way. Right? Like that's, that's where the mindset has to change. Stop trying to tell people why you're right and to get them to believe you, but rather just show them, show them why you're right. And, and that's why it's so important to raise up the organizations that are doing good work, that are solving the problems that we see out there, because as we can point to them more and more, the question isn't so much of sell me on libertarianism, but more, oh, can you tell me more about that? And that right there, government becomes irrelevant. Now, okay, they're they're solving healthcare. Pfft, why am I paying government healthcare services again? I don't I don't need it anymore. Like, wh- yeah. why are we paying for the policing when we have our, our little private military force that we were paying for? <laughs> right? If we're gonna go to Incapistan, like, let, let, you can play that game if you can present the solution that exists out there. Dude, and I that's know, why I know you're super mad about the pandemic, but I was like, this is Candyland, right? Like, okay, <sighs> look at how the CDC and the FDA don't work. Look at how the federal government can't protect you in a crisis. Look at how the federal government kills a hundred thousand more people because they do because of nursing home mistakes and a lack of testing. And look how they screwed up the vaccine distribution. Look how they look out, look out, look out, look out. Like, and now look at the hyper, look at the inflation that's about to hit. You know, the Wall Street Journal is reporting. Oh, it looks like inflation is starting to happen. What's happened? How'd this happen? Why are lumber prices so high? It's like we know our ideas are right. And this has been the best year to illustrate. I'm not trying to be a dick, but we predicted that this stuff is kind of going to happen. And so here's the solution and here's what we don't want to do in the future. You know, so I think I think in those conversations, you know, when people are frustrated about the pandemic, you know, it's 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 a great opportunity to kind of show this is what we're talking about. You know, here's the solution, you know, sheltering in place and voluntarily people making their own decisions would have led to better results distributed testing like i don't know i think it, it's it's been a great year for convincing people that our ideas are right <laughs> or at least waking people up getting people to say like wait this isn't working and that's part yeah. partly the biggest uh you know the biggest challenge in in sales in general is overcoming status quo status quo is the incumbent vendor status quo is the incumbent parties um it's it's the incumbent way of doing things, which is you go along to get along. Yeah, spend seven trillion dollars a year, you do it. Like that's just right. been the mentality, right? So it it requires the people to come in and disrupt the status quo to get people to feel enough pain or at least acknowledge that their pain exists and then to help transition them away from that, right? To to show, like, hey, listen, look at look at what I have as a great opportunity for you over here. And, and I think it's it's even a step further, Chris, than just like saying like, hey, if we had done this, this would how, how, how it wouldn't wouldn't have turned out like tell that story. But then say and have a solution, say like, here's what we should have done. And guess what we did? Here's what we have now as a solution going forward. So this is not going to happen again. And oh, by the way, this is a liberty solution. That's where we're really going to have rubber meeting the road and people like taking that step from this is a good idea to this is helping my life right now. Let's leave it there. The Brian Nichols show, Brian Nichols show.com. You can subscribe anywhere. Uh, you're listening to this podcast, please make sure you give a shout out. If you got something out of this episode, please share Brian final thoughts, Chris. Uh, I, I know it's, I do this every time that we speak, but like, thank you uh, for giving me a shot in the network. Um, it, it means a lot that you've, giving me the chance to talk to, you know, literally like tens of thousands of people now a month, which is just mind boggling that people want to listen to me. But I, I really appreciate that we have not just, you know, a chance to reach people, but we have a network of people who very, very much uh, disagree in a lot of different areas, but that's so important for us to have a conducive and healthy, you know, dialogue because, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Did you watch The Mandalorian by chance when mm-hmm. that came out? No. Okay. So John Favreau is is one of the directors, but he's also the mastermind in helping get all these directors together for the different episodes. 
And there's a, a show on Disney that's more of a round table but behind the scenes. And one of the points that John Favreau makes is that like every single one of the directors at the table is so fundamentally different in not only the way they approach filmmaking, but the way they approach storytelling or the way that they, they want their characters to deliver lines. But it was so important to have each of their unique voices and their unique flavors in the series in order for the series to be as awesome as it has been. And, and that kind of like resonates all across, not just, you know, the, the world of cinema, but in the world of politics, in the world of business. And you said this earlier, a movement is going to collect a lot of different people. Yep, it is a hundred percent. It's going to collect in this case, if our goal is to grow this sucker, millions of people, right. And, and to acknowledge that they're not all going to be libertarian, that's okay. But to instead focus on the value that those individuals are bringing to the table and what more they can bring to the table once we make their lives more free. The more we're able to bring freedom to real ordinary people, the more we're going to allow them the chance to do extraordinary things. Very good. Brian Nichols, thank you so much. Please subscribe to The Brian Nichols Show. Thank you all for listening, and we will see you again next weekend.